Tēnā tātou katoa, ko Grant Smith tōko e nara, no Oto Tahi Aho. Um, I'd just like to present today some of our work to try and understand how metal rust disease is caused, how this fungus can infect such a wide host range of mitosis plants. This project's part of a, a long stream of research to try and get to an understanding about how metal rust is caused. It's funded by uh, Biological Heritage Naraki Takitaki and it interacts with a number of other projects. Uh, we know there is resistance in Tainga, but we don't know why this pathogen is able to operate as a multi host rust. We do know that there is there is resistance, but we do not actually understand the genetic basis of plant resistance. But can we understand the molecular basis of disease and help identify which targets in the plant are being targeted by the pathogen to manipulate uh, the, the, the plant cells so that the pathogen can successfully complete its replication cycle. And, and some of the outcomes from this also are being used to um, as potential targets for novel control technologies, for example, um, RNA interference, and we're targeting these very early pathogenistic determinants. Okay, so main, and we already know that in many mitosis species there is little or no resistance, and that includes in Ramarama, Rahutu, and Pahutukawa. There is some resistance in Manuka and Kanuka, but it's complicated. There are both stem and leaf resistances that are independent and we know we now know that uh, based on the uh, genetic studies that David Chana and colleagues have been doing that they are that those two resistances map to different genome to different chromosomes in the Manuka genome so, so it's quite a complicated system. Pathologists approach studying uh, pathogens with the concept of the disease triangle for disease to occur, you need a pathogen present, a susceptible host, and an environment conducive to the pathogen being able to infect the host. In particular with myrtle rust, humidity is quite important during the spore germination process, and without high, relatively high humidity, uh, even with the pathogen present, you won't get infection. So Ostropoxinia sedi is an obligate biotroph, which means it must interact with and obtain nutrition from living plant cells. So in doing that, the pathogen's got to suppress the plant pathogen detection systems of the, of the plant and prevent plant resistance fire program cell death, which is apoptosis, which is basic, the basis of L2 resistance in the leaves um, program cell death. Many pathogens produce effectors and to, to uh, interact with their hosts and to and ultimately to gain nutrition and complete their, their uh, replication cycle. Now this pathogen genome has over 350 predicted effector genes which is about 2% of the total of um, there's about 19,000 genes in this um, pathogen. That's about average for a rust pathogen. We, so we're trying to investigate what are the role of effectors in the establishment and maintenance of infection in plants. Um, and effectors are expressed over time course of infection. Uh, <clears throat> and we've, but we're trying to focus as much as possible on early expression of pathogen genes as potential control targets. So this is a, a figure of lift, uh, taken from the Tansley review by Lorraine et al. a few years ago which shows uh, the expression of pathogen genes. So the secreted proteins include the effectors. They're those orange peaks, those five orange peaks. You can, from that, you can see that there's different effectors being produced as a series of waves or a series of pulses during the infection process through to, through to just before sporulation so, or the eruption of and production of, of new spores. So the effectors that are important in establishing disease are then replaced by other ones in terms of gaining control and manipulating and finally uh, replication. So 
who I think we're most most of us familiar with the images of James Webb looking back in time to the origins of, of the universe. What we're trying to do is to look back to the very first events that occur and in the interaction between this germinating spore and its host uh, when they've been inoculated onto leaves. So when we look at uh, the early express pathogen genes, um, we see the presence of effectors. Um, we see them sort of going through those pulsy wave. Um, so the L5, the, the red and the um, and the orange, we're seeing more effector in those, probably because the, the pathogen's got hold of the plant's resources and is now producing the proteins that it wants, whereas the other ones, due to resistance, uh, either type of resistance, are um, they're not getting past, uh, they're not really able to, well, they can't use the resource of the plant. So you're seeing those curves, um, the data's somewhat noisy. We don't have biological replicates in these experiments and we've got plants from different families, gene families. Uh, they're all stem resistance to, to remove the, the um, complication of that resistance from these studies. Looking back a lot closer to spore germination, so the first points on these, this graph are taken at about 20 minutes after inoculation. We can see fairly high levels of this particular effector uh, in the sequence counts. So that's the amount of um, RNA, so transcript that we can see. And again, uh, noisy data, but we're seeing at least in one of those susceptibles very high levels of effector fairly early on, so six hours, 12 hours, you know, peaking up around six. Uh, a lot of the others are peaking around 12 in terms of uh, their presence and the maximum amount of expression that's being that's being, uh, being driven for those effectors in those, in those plants. So we've got those classic sort of curves um, and some of those effectors may actually be present in ungerminated spores. We don't know that yet. It's part of an investigation to determine. Also been trying to characterize uh, the proteins that are encoded by those RNA sequences uh, in the laboratory. So we're going to so express purify and characterize in the lab. Uh, we have that's some physical data on, on the first effector. It's stable, it's monomeric, which means it exists by itself. It's not a dimer or a trimer. It's elongated in shape and it's got this long flexible tail which we believe probably is the, thing, the, the part of the protein which interacts with the plant protein target to uh, start the manipulation of the plant cell for, um, to, to, the, to the pathogen's benefit. Uh, we're also establishing a used to hybrid uh, Manuka library. Uh, which has uh, been generated with uh, RNA or cDNA from the transcript uh, library to investigate, uh, see if we can find what the plant target is for this effector, this, this particular effector. Each effector will have a different plant target. So in summary, uh, we've identified a number of fungal effectors and other proteins that are likely to be involved in the initial establishment of infection. These identifications are based on the presence and the amount of RNA, those sequence counts and the time course samples. One of fungal effector has been characterized in the laboratory and it's partially characterized. These things are very, very difficult to work on in the laboratory. Um, so a lot of uh, work has to go in to understand uh, the best ways to actually generate them and be able to characterize them in the lab. So work in present, it's still in progress to complete characterization of this protein. And we've also got a bunch of others that are lined up also from, that have been identified in our transcript experiments. Uh, thank you very much for your time. Nami Nui.